I know what you're thinking. Man, when this nigga gonna stop making mixtapes? The answer to that question is never. I just keep coming back and back. I came from the bottom, now I'm riding in the Audi And I'm stunning for the honeys to see for the honeys Now to I'm see. riding downtown yeah. and I'm pressing all these buttons Cause I know that it's the place I to be I gotta one time for my city East side, west side, uptown All I gotta swerve Tear your, you can get it all from the dirt And I ain't tripping all them haters by their gear I gotta swerve Man, you see my girl, she in that passenger That new bitch in the club, you know I'm at I gotta swerve I'm swerving, smoking loud And serving all these packs I keep it presidential Collecting all these scouts You know I'm on a mission in the kitchen Steady whipping, what the fuck you Waiting on man, them birds are steady flipping. You see, I cry for real, and you not likely. I fucks with everybody, putting them on like a spike lid. All that bands watching strippers dance by excitement. All the mall fossil down like my shoes and whitey. And when I cry, I just do it like the worst for Nike. My ride pack of bills by the sight of lightning. All white, everything like you got it. Swerving lane and lane like I just caught a body. Niggas hating you don't know shit about me You get the middle finger while my bank account climbing Network, nigga what's your net worth? I'm one of the hottest underground artists you gon' respect first Years worth, I got 10 years worth And I'ma keep giving you all of this music until your ears hurt I'm on that first clean, that drink with me and ain't nothing clean in my system My eyes low, damn near closed, I swerve so hard, I'm drippin' I said I hurt Belene, that drink with me and ain't nothing clean in my system My eyes low, damn near closed, I swerve so hard, I'm drippin' I gotta swerve, I gotta swerve on them one time from my city East side, west side of town I gotta swerve, tell you all you get it all That new bitch in the club, you know I'm at I gotta swerve. I'm swerving, smoking loud, and serving all these packs. I keep it presidential, collecting all these stacks.
160,000 kids and teens stay home from school every day to avoid being bullied. Hey, I'm Demi Lovato. Believe it or not, I was bullied in school. It hurt so bad I actually left school when I was home. And we can change what's happening. No one deserves to be treated like that. Words hurt. Don't be a part of it. Today on The Global African, we'll talk to DC-based artist Bamani Arma. And we'll also look at African-American Palestinian solidarity. That's Today on The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. We'll be right back. Hip-hop as an art form can be used to teach activism and science creative writing skills, and math. Some say it's the language of our youth. Producer and poet Bamani Arma skillfully uses hip-hop to teach young people the power of perspective and the importance of telling their own stories. My name is Bomani Arma. I am not a rapper. I am a poet with a hip-hop style. Bomani, you say that you're um, a poet with a hip-hop influence, yeah. but not a rapper. Can you explain the distinction? Sure. So, I mean, I track, I track my art form you know, past hip-hop. I love hip-hop, you know what I'm saying? I grew up in it, but I track my art form past that. I connect myself to Langston Hughes. I connect myself to Shakespeare. You know what I'm saying? I can do a poetry reading. I can do it with a DJ. I can do it a cappella. Um, but it's about, you know, understanding and respecting the art form and using the words. Um, and I love rappers, you know what I'm saying? Rappers are some of my favorite artists. But I, when I would go in and teach young people, and I would tell them I'm a rapper, they're like, yo, where's your chain? Where's your car? And I'm like, oh, I'm not that kind of rapper. I'm a poet with a hip hop style, so it all kind of came together. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. In hip hop, you talk with your hands and your voice. One, two, three. For many, the sum of hip hop today is what we see in popular culture gold chains and fast cars. But there are artists like Bomani Arma who represent the hip hop community every day teaching young people how to write, rocking stages at night, and producing albums for other artists. Bomani is a modern-day Renaissance man, believing in music's intrinsic spiritual power to move people with clever lyrics and strong beats. He gained national attention with his song, Read a Book. Read a book, read a book, read a book. Read a book, read a book, read a book. Encouraging young people to read while also teaching old heads the importance of satire by examining how hip hop culture shows up in mainstream media. The sum of his work shows us that he is, in fact, an artist who embodies the power and style of hip hop, the social responsibility of teacher, and the wisdom and observation of poet. Joined for this segment with Bomani Arma, who is a Washington, D.C. based, self identified poet with a hip hop style, who's also known for a 2007 single, Read a Book. He is a teaching artist, a producer, and homeschools his twin sons, Olu and Dela. Welcome to the Global African. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, you don't like to be or don't want to be identified as a rapper. Well, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that began because I started doing spoken word poetry before I started doing hip hop. Um, but I was always doing my poetry to a rhyme, but not on beat. Um, and so I, I started doing that just as an homage, I guess, to rappers and think I'm not trying to do the same thing. But then I started really getting serious about hip hop. But the students I would teach, I would come into class and they'd be like, where's your gold chain? Where's your car? So I'm like, well, I'm not a rapper. You know what I'm saying? It started meaning that a little bit. I think it's the duty of the, the poet, especially in the tradition of black poets to shed light on the community that you're in um, and to give a vision of the community that you want. I mean, like, once again, Langston Hughes is one of the biggest examples of that. When you mention Langston Hughes, mm -hmm. so my great-grandfather was a, a major pre-Harlem Renaissance poet, mm -hmm. uh, author. His name was William Stanley Braithwaite. Okay. And I've read a number of his poems, and there's a complete contrast between his more generally socially progressive commitment mm -hmm. and his poetry. It's not reflected in much of his poetry. Mm. Um, his poetry is almost 19th century British mm -hmm. in some ways. Uh, Hughes, on the other hand, 
very much integrated his uh, critique of the situation facing people of African descent into his poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, that struggle seems to be a struggle that is faced by many artists in, in black America. Mm -hmm. Well, well, Langston and the people who were part of the Harlem Renaissance movement were completely a part of a lot of things going on. They were part of the blues tradition, which is very raw about the realities of people's lives. Um, they were part about part of the activism against the, the anti-lynching campaign. Mm -hmm. um, when, when a black man was getting lynched every two, three days, it was the poets, it was the artists who, who were making mention of it and everything they could write, everything they could sing. Um, she, he was very much an active communist, you know what I'm saying? And communists at the time were very much about using every form of, of, of uh, entertainment and propaganda to get their message mm -hmm. out. So the idea that, um, that your art is directly connected with some kind of social issue, I mean, you couldn't avoid it in, in, in the time that Langston was doing it. And I honestly think you, don't think you can avoid it now. One of the reasons that I, um, I guess I proudly separate myself from the commercial aspect of hip hop is like we've been at war for 15 years. We've been at war for a lot of the young people that I work with. We've been maybe not 15, 13 years, the majority of their lives. I can't tell you the popular song that made it to radio in hip hop addressing the war in any way. You know what I'm saying? Like we, as, as a commercial, commercially, not as a culture, the culture has been making a lot of noise about it. But commercially, there is no recognition in hip hop of a battle that we've been fighting that almost a million people have lost their lives over in Iraq. In the late 60s, early 70s, you had the predecessors of hip hop, mm -hmm. the, the last poets mm -hmm. of Gil Scott Heron, mm -hmm. uh, highly political in, in, their, in their art. But at a certain point, there's like a divergence that seems to happen uh, of, of this tradition. Completely. And I mean, I would throw other artists in there. Uh, I would, I can, James Brown is, is, is one of the godfathers of hip hop. I honestly think, uh, just because I've been overdosing on his, on his music, like the humanity that I hear in Bill Withers' writing mm -hmm. is like the same kind of humanity I hear in Tupac's writing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Very much can relate. Um, I Ain't Mad At You is like one of the best songs ever. And it's about, you know, recognizing that you've gone to a different place in life, but you still love your friends. Um, even if it's not like anti-drugs or violence or something, it's understanding the humanity of people, right? And, um, and watching Bill Withers and watching um, Gil Scott Heron talk about their careers, they always talk about them reaching the point where people wanted to put them in the army B category. Mm -hmm. um, the same struggle Marvin Gaye was going through when no one wanted to put out what's going on. You know what I'm saying? They want to completely make him R&B. And there's ways you can do both. There are always ways you can do both. I mean, I was talking to a good friend of mine. Um, he's, a, he's a banjo player in a folk band. And we were talking about the common connections of all folk art is when it comes down to it, it's about telling women to shake their backside, no matter what culture you come from, right? But they also, also incorporate the struggles they're having with the crops, the struggles they're having, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Trying to recognize whatever culture they're in. So it's all, it's got to be a part of the entire human experience. And, um, and, and yet yeah, commercial, commercial you know, music always wants to cut off that one half of you. Um, and, and my favorite artists always fight against that. Let me ask you a question uh, that I've been, I've been grappling with. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my work has been in the trade union movement. Okay. And um, much of the culture within the trade union movement seems frozen in time. Mm -hmm. When you have performances for example, at union rallies, mm -hmm. it's folk music, um, uh, 1930s, 1940s. Mm -hmm. Guitar. Uh, that's right, guitar, <laughs> guitar solo. Right, right, you know. right, 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 right. And, it, but it seems frozen. Okay. And I'm trying to understand why that happened, mm -hmm. but I'm also trying to understand someone like yourself, what, what would be your critique and what would you say to such a movement about a kind of some sort of cultural renovation. Well, you know, it's interesting. So one of the, the single that I put out a couple years ago is a song called Late Shift. And it's about people who work two, two jobs, um, you know, more than 60, 70 hours a week. And actually, I got a chance to perform that a couple of different um, union related benefits and they all loved it. But uh, uh, it was an interesting dichotomy or difference between that and the other performers that would come up. Right. And um, I definitely think all uh, all movements need to embrace, especially youth culture. 
um, popular culture. Um, I love, you know, being PG County, Washington, D.C. I love bounce beat. Um, I'm a little older than the kids in D.C. who are doing go-go bounce beat, but the actual rhythm of it mm -hmm. is powerful. If you see the kids in PG County and D.C. move to it, you understand that it's powerful. And finding a way to incorporate that sound into the songs that we do about our reality. Um, I'm, I got blessed to do a project with um, Chuck Brown's band and some members of the Free Minds Book Club, which is um, incarcerated youth who are part of a book and writing club in prison, and then they stay in it when they come out. And we took a bounce beat and made it a about what they're doing. Now you um, are involved in in various ways in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I, I'm, <laughs> I would say no. Um, I'm very much involved in the Black community. I'm very proud to be Black, and I and I, I'm I'm not a protester. Um, um, Martin Luther King used to tell the protesters that if you can't um, promise that no matter what happens, you're not going to be violent, please don't come. And I took that to heart, and so I don't really show up at the protest. Um, but I am, be I am behind the idea of people mobilizing and getting their voice out. Um, Black Lives Matter feels wrong coming out of my mouth, just the actual phrase. Um, <laughs> the concept works with me, but saying Black Lives Matter feels like saying water is wet. Like, it should just be like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. like that can't be my I'm, my I, I'm human is not my rallying cry. Mm -hmm. I, I, that, that was my grandfather's rallying cry. That was my father's rallying cry till he was like 25 or 30. But it's my generation is being like, you know, my life matters, and I, you're gonna you're gonna respect that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna ask you for it. I'm gonna demand that. Um, and so I'm with the movement in the sense that I understand what they're trying to accomplishment accomplish, but. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a, it's not a strong enough statement for me uh, in that sense. So, so two things. Well, so a you, maybe you need to amend the mm -hmm. statement, right? Uh -huh. But the other thing that I would say about Black Lives Matter as it, uh, is that the part of what I think is important about the statement is that it is actually an anti genocidal statement. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not simply. But I don't know if you can ask to not be killed off. I no, think you no, have to. No, but I don't think it's asking. Okay. I think it's an assertion. It's an assertion. Okay. Yeah, it's an assertion. I don't think it's like asking, please mm -hmm. don't kill us, mm -hmm. right? I think it's more. I mean, this is the way I interpret it. I got you. It is that it's an assertion that yes, we are humans. We are not going to be killed off, mm -hmm. right? That that uh, that. It's it's actually an interesting assertion around the whole concept of race mm -hmm. in that what race and racism does is that it basically says that there is an irrelevant and an irrelevant population. There's one population whose experiences are important mm -hmm. and another who's not, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I, I think of Black Lives Matter as saying, yes, we are human. We We are not going to be the victims of genocide, mm. something like that. Do you, you know I, I, I agree with it, and and, and I don't, and I, I've, I've never like I kind of write extensively on social media and my own blogs about what I see going on in the movement, and mm -hmm. I and I appreciate it. Don't get me wrong, like oh, no, I got yeah, you. Um, but I guess. So my amendment would yeah. be the, the I wish the MF would movement. You know what I'm saying? Like I want I want to set up a scenario where you that can't happen. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Where we're not asking you to please recognize that this 17 year old black boy is just as valuable as that 15 year old white girl that went missing and that you show the pictures. How do you recommend integrating the cultural perspective, the artistic perspective that you're offering mm -hmm. into? Political activism. I know personally, one of the ways that I've I've learned to create my art and do my art activism and education together is to go to meetings and organizations like you're talking about and have us write a song together, to have a brainstorming session where we're talking about it. So it's not, um, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of Paulo Freire, um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And one of his biggest, the biggest concept that sticks in my head about that is not going to these communities and telling them what their problems are. Mm -hmm. Not assuming that I know just because, even like my experience with the Baltimore riots, and I think sometimes artists, uh, Artists or just activists in general, like think they can represent. They 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 think they understand um, what a particular movement is because they've seen Eyes on the Prize or something like that, or they've read some headlines. And I think we have to integrate ourselves into that community. Mani Arma, thank you very much for no joining problem. us. And we definitely need to stay in touch. Cool, definitely. Thank right. you. I appreciate thank, it. Thanks very much. No problem. Take care. And thank you very much for joining us for this segment of the Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher, and we'll be back in a moment. Don't go anywhere.
There's a fascinating link to be made between the story of the struggle for African Americans living in the United States and Palestinians experiencing Israeli occupation. Whether it's whites only water fountain signs or being subject to racist points of entry by the Israeli government, African Americans and Palestinians understand what it is like to live under the boot of oppression and apartheid. How can we create lines of support and solidarity between the two groups that share so much in common with each other? That's what we're going to be exploring in this segment. We're now joined by two guests, Jaziri X, who's an MC and community activist and is a host of the groundbreaking internet news series This Week with Jaziri X. He also participated in a delegation that went to occupied Palestine and Israel in early 2014. Also joining us is Youssef Munea, who is a political analyst, writer, and currently the executive director of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. Prior to joining the U.S. campaign, he was the executive director of the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center, and he also served as a policy analyst for the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. Welcome to The Global African, both of you. Thank you. Thanks. So um, we wanted to look at this issue of African-American Palestinian solidarity. And I wanted to start with a very basic question. Is there any basis to discuss that, in, that concept? Uh, I, mean, I think uh, there's absolutely a basis, um, particularly in terms of, um, you know, the, the similarities in the, in the, in the way um, we have been oppressed over here in the United States. Um, as people of color and the oppression I saw um, in Palestine, um, you know, what I, I tell people, you know, what I saw in Palestine uh, was white supremacy on steroids. And it was really, um, you know, sort of, and it, um, it, 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 was, it was shocking in a sense that it was so blatant um, in 2000, at that time, 2014, and it was so blatant that you had this system that was set up purely on, you know, what your ethnicity was. And so, you know, we really, we really witnessed a an apartheid state taking place in 2014 in terms of, um, you know, license plates being different. You know, you can't drive on this road if you're Palestinian. Uh, you can't uh, move freely through this area if you're Palestinian. You have to walk through this checkpoint and be dehumanized um, every day. And you know, um, it's very similar to you know these stop and frisk policies that we see. Um, as black Americans in New York City, really all over the place, that if a few of us congregate on the street corner, all of a sudden, you know, we're automatically labeled criminals, you know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. Over there, it's like if you're Palestinian, you're like, you're like labeled a terrorist until you're proved otherwise. And it's like, you know, as, 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 as uh, African Americans in the United States, we're labeled as criminals and thugs unless we prove otherwise. And even sometimes if we prove otherwise, we still are, 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 are treated you know, um, uh, uh, firstly, as criminals and thugs. So I think it's on that basis of uh, of that oppression is that that we can find solidarity in terms of, you know, how can we work together to really expo expose, you know, the disease of white supremacy that's uh, that's uh, I, I feel most prevalent in the United States of America and Israel. Somebody who has been very active in the cause of Palestinian justice, they weren't themselves Palestinian, said to me that that I shouldn't use the term race because there's a debate uh, among Palestinians as to whether a racial framework is at all applicable. Now, I was on the same delegation that Jaziri was in early 2014 and had been to the occupied territories a, a couple of years prior. And it sure seemed to me that a racial framework applied. And I just wondered, what's your take on that? What was at stake in that comment that was made to me? I think there's, there's often sometimes uh, hesitation to apply uh, analogies because no analogies really fit perfectly. But I think there's a lot of use in the racial framework that, that, that uh, you mentioned. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give you a recent example. We saw the, the, the heinous attack on the historic black church in Charleston the other day by a white supremacist a white supremacist who, um, you know, wore proudly the flags of apartheid South Africa and Rhodesia uh, and, and pulled up into the parking lot of a historic black church with Confederate flags on his license plate. And, and he believed uh, in a segregationist system, and he believed that there were uh, too many blacks in 
society, that black people were taking over, that he said, quote, raping our women. Uh, and this is the same kind of language that's used often to talk about Palestinians, not at the margins of Israeli society, but really by officials and leaders within Israeli society when they refer to people like myself, who happen to be Palestinian citizens of Israel, and other Palestinians as demographic threats. So when you talk about a specific class of people who happen to be of a different ethnicity, a different color, a different background, as demographic threats, you know, we, we can talk about whether or not, uh, you know, Palestinian identity and Jewish identity really fits within the framework of race, but the same basic concept of otherization and domination is there, and I don't think we can ignore it. Let me ask a final question to the two of you. Uh, what are some examples of things that you have either seen or would recommend as a way of building stronger solidarity? Well, I'm going to tell you, you know, one of the realest conversations that uh, uh, I remember having in Palestine in, in, in early 2014 uh, was with a, a brother. And I, I, I wish I um, remembered his name because I've told this story over and over again, but we were at a, we were in Ramallah. We were at a, I don't know if it was like a bar, or nightclub, wherever we were. <laughs> um, but I remember him telling me, he said, you know, uh, he said, Jasir, you know why, you know, black people in America um, should re really be paying attention to what's happening in Palestine. He said, because the policing that you see over here um, is coming to a hood near you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, uh, eight, eight months later, I'm in Ferguson going through a checkpoint um, that was set up in, in Ferguson uh, because of the rebellion um, that happened in regards to the death of Michael Brown. And so to me, I mean, you know, uh, how the Palestinian community, um, you know, uh, you know, even, you know, helping people to understand like how to deal with tear gas and how to, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of get through that in terms of the uprisings that we saw in Ferguson. And then, you know, recently saw in Baltimore, the fact that, you know, the same, you know, weapons were used um, and, you know, these uprisings here in America that were that are used in Palestinians and Israel, the same tear gas, the same, you know, maker. Um, and so to me, these are very real things. Um, and so I think I think those concrete steps of really uh, learning about one another, putting ourselves in one another's shoes um, and then, you know, uh, uh, helping one another, whether it's, you know, uh, um, letting the world know what's happening in places like Gaza or letting the world know what's happening in places like Ferguson or Baltimore. I think those, um, um, uh, those uh, 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 connections are being made. Um, and to me, ultimately, it's our unity that's going to have liberation for everybody. I feel like the reason why, you know, it's a race issues all over the place because white supremacy is dominating the globe. And until us as oppressed people all come together and, and begin to wage war on it, wherever it is, um, it's at that point that we get freedom. Youssef, you have the last word. Well, I, I think as, you know, Jasiri said, those experiences uh, are really invaluable. Uh, going, going over there, seeing firsthand, uh, and it's, you know, it, it, it's very difficult here to get a real appreciation for what the situation is like uh, over there without going and seeing it and experiencing it. Um, it's, it's, it's different than, uh, you know, on, on this end, it's a lot easier for uh, us to see, for example, um, the, the African-American experience in many inner cities because these things can be accessible to us. Uh, where, whereas, you know, to, to really understand the Palestinian experience uh, in, involves, um, you know, overcoming serious hurdles. And, and, and you know, I really applaud uh, anyone who makes that trip to go see because it is, it is eye-opening. And one of the most inspiring things that I saw come out of, um, you know, those events when it comes to, um, you know, Palestinian and, and, and black solidarity was a tweet by um, one person who was sitting in a, a, a prison cell ha after having been arrested. And he said, you know, I'm African-American and I'm sitting here in my free Palestine T-shirt next to my friend who's Palestinian-American and wearing a Black Lives Matter T-shirt. Um, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, that's what it's really about. It's about being willing to make, you know, those kind of sacrifices because, it, you know, when, when the t-shirts come off, we're all human underneath. 
And, and it, when you realize that and you realize that so many of these experiences are shared, the only reaction, the natural reaction is, is for those solidarity connections to come into being. So um, I think that that, you know, is, is, is very important for the way forward. And, and it's really inspired many of us to continue to do this work. Youssef Manea and Jaziri X, thank you very, very much for joining us for The Global African. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. Okay. And thanks for joining us for this episode of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Just push that coffee table to one side and Yeah, yes, yes. MC Jack, Mente Libre Studio 2014 Vendrán cosas mejores La vida me ha enseñado a estarme preparado Porque no sé si es amigo o enemigo El de al lado marcado Por tinta de colores en cerveza y poesía Yo olvido ex amores que algún día me entregaron felicidad, recuerdo todavía en amarga soledad las traiciones Y que aún hay posibilidad de que estas palabras sueltas tengan credibilidad Cosas que vienen y otras que se van, habrá personas en tu vida que marcas dejarán Mira hacia adelante, nunca más hacia atrás, que los malos recuerdos miren cómo te vas todos saben que eres fuerte, lo debes de hacer por una mala decisión Te puedes joder, en este mundo frío, aún hay esperanza Yo sé que en ocasiones, hasta el pensar te cansa Mujeres hay muchas, te lo juro de a montón Fíjate muy bien a quien le entregas tu corazón Porque de nada vale hacerle una canción Si todo se va a la basura en un momento de pasión Susurros en silencio, gritándole al viento Se rompe la confianza mientras le dices lo siento Te da las de papel y te impulsa a volar Otro cuerpo te dio el placer que ya se atrevió a negar Vendrán cosas mejores, otras oportunidades No te creas de impostores que van fingiendo amistades Vendrán cosas mejores se trata de creer y de volver a soñar Varia gente me dijo tocar el cielo es imposible Pero me levanté del suelo y me sentí increíble El día de hoy a mis ojos ya nada es invisible Ganaré la guerra contra el que se cree invencible Recuerdos, promesas y sueños que se mueren Palabras, acciones y miradas que hieren No hagas algo de lo que te arrepientas trata siempre de expresar Lo que por dentro sientas porque todo se acumula Y al final revientas la verdad siempre se sabe Por mucho que tú mientas así que mejor Habla con sinceridad Lo sé el mundo es cruel esa es la realidad Inspiración creada a base de suspiros La vida te sorprende con cada uno de sus giros Pero estamos preparados nada nos sorprenderá Que venga lo que venga ya nada nos vencerá Vendrán cosas mejores, de eso estoy seguro Aunque a veces te sientas entre la espada y el muro Vendrán cosas mejores, no volverás a caer Para que salga el arco iris, primero debe llover Tú eres el dueño de tu vida y de tus sueños Si quieres llegar a la meta debes ponerle empeño Mira hacia adelante, nunca más hacia atrás Que se cumple el deseo de esa estrella fugaz Así como hay subidas, también hay bajadas No gastes tu vida buscando un cuento de hadas Mejor gasta tu crédito en mensajes sin llamadas En personas que te apoyaron y has dejado olvidadas, olvidadas.